Uh, thank you all for joining us. i trying to think how best to start this. We have been at it in this class with many people in this class and community members talking about the legacy of Senator Patrick Leahy for since really early September when Secretary Ann Barry, the uh, Secretary of the U.S. Senate, kicked it off. And we've had different policymakers through at this podium as well as at the, the, the desk. We've had staffers. We've had uh, campaign managers. And of course, we've had Senator and Mrs. Leahy themselves. And it's been, it's been incredibly lively. And it has, I think, opened up a lot of our eyes, not only to Senator Leahy, but what happened during his time in office, in his lifetime. And I think what a good historian, a good writer does is, is kind of put more of in a biography of just not just what's happening to that person, but what's happening around that person that makes the person make those certain decisions at certain times. And tonight we're going to kind of close things out for this term and talk in a little bit more detail about Senator Leahy's legacy, statewide, nationally, and around the world. And we have two gentlemen with us who are really uh, the perfect choices uh, to help us navigate this final evening. I'm going to tell you a little bit about both of them. And like so many of our guests, we could go on and on and spend a lot of time talking about their biographies and their own accomplishments. But I'm going to keep it brief and then hand it over to them. The two of them are going to have a conversation. Then we'll open it up for a conversation. So community members, students can ask questions. How does that sound? Good. So with that, to uh, to my far right, we have Luke Albee, and I should mention neither of these students, uh, neither of these gentlemen, and I don't think any of our guests are Bennington College alums. Uh, so uh, take that for what it's worth. Um, maybe not make the questions too hard. Uh, <laughs> but both are incredibly accomplished. Luke Albee it has been described as the Dean of the Senate Chiefs of Staff by Politico, an incredible accomplishment has served as Chief of Staff to Senators Mark Warner and Senator Patrick Leahy. He has directed a broad array of legislative, policy, political communication activities for both senators. He has a master's degree in international relations from the London School of Economics and is a graduate of the University of Vermont. Chris Graff, to his left, graduated from Middlebury College with a degree in American history. In 1978, uh, Chris joined the staff of the Associated Press as a reporter in the Vermont Bureau located in Montpelier. Two, day, two years later, he was placed in charge of the Bureau, a post he held until 2006. In his years with the Associated Press, Graff covered the critical stories as the state transformed itself from a rural Republican outpost in the state of, to the, into the state of Howard Dean, Jim Jeffords, Bernie Sanders, and of course, Patrick Leahy. So students, and I would say this to community members as well, it's a real opportunity to talk to people with really incredibly remarkable tenures in state government, in journalism, who have watched and participated in how this state has transformed itself over the years. So please keep the questions lively, Ask what you want. I know some of you have been thinking about this, but let's get a conversation going. And with that, I'll turn it over to the two of you so you can say a few words. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I love that line, incredibly tenured. I think he just means old. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Luke and I are great. We're going to balance each other out really well. Um, in a lot of different ways. One, uh, Luke is the ultimate insider. He has seen the inside of the Senate and probably knows the U.S. Senate as well as anyone in American history. I'm the outsider. I was a journalist, and I have the perspective of an outsider. We also approach life differently. 
I've got a prepared text that is on a teleprompter here that I'll be reading you. Luke showed up with an empty notebook and a pen, and he had to ask me for a pen. So um, <clears throat> that's how we approach life a little differently. Um, but I think the topic of this class is a really, and this whole fall forum is just a wonderful one. It is one, uh, the Leahy legacy that people will be talking about for decades to come. There's a lot of material here. And, you know, I think of the mo movie Forrest Gump. I think some of you will know that movie, 1994, where the main character uh, witnessed and influenced most of the major events of the 20th century. There he was in the Vietnam War with John F. Kennedy. He was uh, causing the resignation of Richard Nixon and even buying Apple stock long before anyone knew of its potential. That movie was so absolutely implausible. There's just no way anyone in the world could witness that much history except Patrick Leahy did. He was at center stage for most of the major events of American history for nearly 50 years. You know, when you just think of the numbers, it's incredible. He served with more than 400 senators and nine presidents. 400 senators. It just even boggles the mind what you have to think about that you had to work with those senators, you had to know them, you had to know those nine presidents, and he did, and he was part of it. <clears throat> We're gonna go tonight wherever the discussion, you lead us in that discussion, but I wanna make sure that, um, that you at least take away four points from me. And those four points are that, and some of this repeats, I know that you've heard in past Thursdays, um, we heard that Carolyn Dwyer talked about some of this last week, but Senator Leahy almost didn't happen. That's point one. Point two, Senator Leahy will never happen again. Point three, we'll talk a little about the value of the long view. And this gets a little into the power of seniority, and I think Luke will be able to talk more about this, but um, that's a very important thing. And then the the fourth point I want to make sure you leave here tonight understanding, because I think it's the most critical one today, is that the Senate to which Patrick Leahy was first elected in 1974 no longer exists. It just doesn't exist. So the first point, and this is what Carolyn was talking about last week, I, but I want to reinforce this partly because it's really important in understanding Pat Leahy and his tenure. Two, I was there at the beginning in 1974. I was actually with Pat Leahy on election night in 1974 at the Ramada Inn in South Burlington. And he showed up and he said that night, I was told to prepare two speeches, one if I lose and one if I lose badly. And that absolutely was the truth everyone expected Pat Leahy to lose that election in 1974. He was a Democrat running in a Republican state. No Vermont Democrat had ever won a U.S. Senate seat. Understand that. It's so important. For a hundred years, Vermont was the most Republican state in the nation. From the 1850s through the 1950s, only Republicans were elected here. And there was a traditional political ladder that you climbed in Vermont. If you look at the two senators who were serving at the time, Bob Stafford, who was uh, the senator at the time, had been attorney general, lieutenant governor, governor, member of the U.S. House, and then U.S. senator. George Aiken, who was the senior U.S. senator at the time, had been uh, member of the Vermont House, Speaker of the House, Lieutenant Governor, Governor, and U.S. Senator. Pat Leahy was a county prosecutor. That's it. That was it. He was the state's attorney in Chittenden County. That's not how people were elected to the U.S. Senate from Vermont. The Republican candidate 
had the right resume. He'd been Speaker of the Vermont House, he'd been a member of the State Senate, he'd been in the Governor's Cabinet, and then elected to the U.S. House. His name was Richard Mallory. But Pat Leahy had his finger on the pulse of Vermont at the time. He knew the times were changing, and I know you talked about this in some of your past forums, with, I think with Carolyn too. It was the Watergate year. And Pat Leahy campaigned in a different way from the way others did. I remember campaigning, I was covering him, he was campaigning, he would walk around with his jacket thrown over his shoulder and he would just meet people and talk with people. It wasn't as formal as most campaigns in Vermont. He posted on his campaign headquarters notices of every campaign donation he received. No one had ever done that before. It made all the difference. On election night, the outcome was in doubt till after midnight, and the margin was very narrow. I think it was like 4,000 votes between Mallory and Leahy. Leahy won. Bernie Sanders was in that race. He got about 5,000 votes, um, which I think was about 1%. And Pat Leahy became uh, the U.S. Senator. My second point, Leahy will never happen again. He, when he retired, he was number one in seniority. He twice served as president pro tem. He chaired appropriations, judiciary, and agriculture committee. He served, as I said, with 400 senators, nine presidents. Pretty remarkable record. There are the host of variables that gave the senator that longevity, that power, the two main ones are his election at a very young age, 34, in what became a safe state. It wasn't a safe state for him in 1974, and it wasn't even when he was reelected in 1980. He only won with 49.8% of the vote in 1980. They called him landslide lady the first two times. He didn't even get a majority. It wasn't until 1986 when Luke came on board and a bunch of other people and they blew the Republican out of the water and it became a safe state. But to put in perspective how unusual Pat Leahy is and was, so he served 48 years. The current Senate, 90 of the 100 senators have served 22 years or less. 55 senators, that's more than half, have served 10 years or less. So think about that. Think of what, it doesn't happen anymore. We don't have people with that tenure, and we won't. Bernie Sanders has served only 16 years, and he's, what, 82? And Pat, uh, Peter Welsh has only served less than a year and he's 76. The value of the long view. This is really important, and I think Luke will be able to really shed a lot of light on this because we talk about the U.S. representatives having two-year terms and the senators having six-year terms. And in the Virginia plan, they'd never set out what the terms would be of the representatives or the senators. But they said of the senators, it ought to be long enough that they are independent, that they can be independent. And we've seen that those six-year terms don't always lead to that. But when you have 48 years, it allows you to do so much more. And I think if, I think you've read uh, Patrick Leahy's memoir, and what you can see in there is some of these issues that he grabbed hold of and was able to then work on year after year after year, little bit by little bit. And this again is where Luke will come into play because some of those big issues like Cuba, uh, Luke was there in Cuba with Castro and Leahy. Uh, Luke was there actually when the anthrax letter came, that wasn't an issue, but it was a big thing. And Luke was there as well through all of land mines. And, and you, you'll get a sense that it just doesn't happen 
you know, in a two-year span or four-year or six-year term. It really takes, you have to plant the seed, you have to work, you have to build, and this really takes a long time. So my fifth and final point that I want to make sure that I leave you with tonight, the Senate to which Patrick Leahy was first elected just no longer exists. The Senate that approved Sandra Day O'Connor 99 to zero just doesn't exist. The Senate that Patrick Leahy joined in 1975 where conservatives Barry Goldwater and liberals like Hubert Humphrey just sat and talked together and worked together and made law together is long gone. You know, the short-term perspective is that all of this stems from Donald Trump, but it doesn't. It stems much longer than that. You can draw all the way back 40 years, the start of the rise of the far right. You can go to Waco, Texas and Branch Davidian. You can carry it forward and you can see a direct line to where we are today in our politics. And I think you can see over that same time, the disillusion of the Senate that Pat Leahy first joined. Those of you who have done the reading and read the memoir know that when you get to the end of the book, you know, it's pretty sad. And he ends on a hopeful note, you know, because he's an optimistic man. But he says, yes, the Senate is a broken place. And that's absolutely true. And we can talk more about that tonight. And with that, now that I've given Luke all those things to talk about, I had to do that because he's got nothing written in his notebook. <laughs> Here's Luke. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm just going to speak for an hour, an hour and a half, and then maybe we'll have time for one question. Um, it's true, I didn't go to Bennington College. I couldn't have gotten in. I went to the University of Vermont because my dad taught there. I was a horrible high school student. I wouldn't have got in if he didn't have a little pull in the admissions office. I certainly couldn't have got into Chris's alma mater, Middlebury. Um, they tend to shy away from Vermonters. And, and, um, um, it, it's time for me to say a couple nice things about Chris. Um, Back in the day, or as my kids, I have four young adult children, say the olden days, Chris really was the center of gravity in the Vermont Press Corps. And not only that, he was the center of gravity for Vermonters who were interested in public policy issues. And part of the thing that makes Vermont so special is that we have an outsized role. Citizens don't just think of themselves as local folks. They have a national perspective and they have an international perspective. And, you know, back in the day, there wasn't Fox News. There wasn't MSNBC. People didn't live in their little cocoons where they weren't, they didn't have access to all types of information. And Chris was, he was the moderator of the weekly news show. He was the head of the Vermont AP. And from the inside, as kind of an inside rat who really tried to manipulate news coverage for my boss, you know, if Chris believed you, you were in good shape. If he thought you were blowing smoke, you were in trouble. So it's you, great. You tried to manipulate it? Just a little bit. <laughs> now, I'm shocked. The other thing is, while I didn't go to Bennington, I was born on Bennington Battle Day. And another person who you may have heard of was born on Bennington Battle Day is Madonna. Madonna and I share August 16th as Bennington Battle Day. She's actually a year older than I am, believe it or not. Um, I haven't had quite as much work done. As um, and I'll tell you, my first Cuba story was we did go down. The Baltimore Royals went down. It was 1999. You guys weren't born in 1999. But as we were coming out, you were? OK, OK, good. Um, um, as we were coming out, the Orioles went down to play the Cubans. And as kind of the, a precursor, Obama didn't open things up for another nine years. We were coming out of the game. They said, you're having dinner with Castro. And it was with Senator Leahy, Senator Jack Reed, Tim Reeser, who I think has come and talked to you. And I was the only person in the group that knew anything about baseball. 
And it's true that Castro was an idiot savant in baseball. And so Senator Leahy, as he always would do, he pulls staff right up and he, he's, I'm introduced to Castro, who speaks perfect English, but not to Americans. And I said, nice to meet you. He said, Castro goes, you and I have met before. And I said, well, you're probably mistaking me for a famous Hollywood actor. And he goes, yes, the actor Nicholas Cage. <laughs> I'm like, OK. OK, so here's the thing. When I worked for Mark Warner, he tended to talk a lot. And so I, someone gave me cards that I still have. And I'm going to give one to Chris and one to Brian. And they simply say, stop talking. So when I go on too long, one of you can just hand me that card, and I'll stop. Um, <laughs> um, I, I will be relatively brief. Terrible high school student, pretty good college student, went to graduate school because I literally had no idea what I was going to do with my life. I was a busboy. I waited on Senator Leahy at the Ice House restaurant in Burlington. He had just come out for the SALT II Treaty. I was studying strategic studies and international relations. I was so motivated. I went home. I got my manual typewriter. Do you guys know what typewriters are? And I applied for an internship and got flatly rejected. And the story I say is one day I vowed to run his office. I went to graduate school because I literally didn't know what else to do. Um, and then I moved to DC. I got very lucky. I got a job answering multi-issue mail in Senator Leahy's office when I was 23 years old. What we used to do, as Chris may remember, is if we had a press release, we would send it on a fax machine to our Montpelier office. They would make two copies of it. And to get it to Bennington and Brattleboro, they'd put it on a bus. And they would have a reporter meet the bus to get our press releases. That's how old I am. Um, I ended up, I, yes, I worked on his campaign. I, was his, I worked briefly for Governor Dukakis when he was running for president. I came back. I was his ledge director and became his chief of staff in 1993. In those days, a pretty a relatively young age, 34. And I was his chief of staff from 1993 to 2005. Were you guys born in 2005? Yes? OK. That's good. Um, I left to lobby and consult because we have four children. My wife um, is much more professionally accomplished than I am. She's worked at NPR, National Public Radio, for 25 years. She ran the White House desk. She runs a bunch of podcasts. If all you young people don't listen to Life Kit, put that on your list. Um, do you? OK, you're the demographic. Um, um, Anyway, then I went back. I wasn't planning to go back. I, I did because I had some experience in the Senate. I helped newly elected senators figure out how to set up their offices. And I was set up with Mark Warner from Virginia. He's a lot more conservative than I am. He always referred to me as his resident communist. Um, I ended up going back and was his chief of staff for seven years. And then, anyway, here's, here's what I'll say about Senator Leahy. Basically, everything, I, I agree with everything Chris said. Um, one of the keys, the, the prism through which we always viewed how to budget his time and what we did as an office was three things. And I'm a big three-point plan guy. When we were doing debates in 1986, we had a five-point ag plan. He could never remember all five points, so we decided three points. And what I always tell politicians is you have to have three points for everything. Why are you running for office? What you're going to do? What's wrong with your opponent? We viewed the world in three ways. State, nation, and the world. And Brian set that up. for me. And that is, everything that he did, we would decide, basically, what three things were our priority in Vermont, what three things were our priority nationally, um, and what three things were we pursuing internationally. And that, that guided everything we did. And a huge key to his success was that he trusted, once he trusted his staff, we had a lot of leeway to go and act on his behalf. And, and we knew he would have our back. You know, one example of this was we got to declare Lake Champlain a Great Lake. And this goes to my obsession that everything in politics now is performative. What happened was zebra mussels were invading Lake Champlain. Do you guys know what zebra mussels are? Okay. 
Um, the only program nationally where there was zebra mussel money was for the Great Lakes. And so we had a great environmental staffer. She now lives in Alaska. And she came to me and said, what she was able to do is just write into the bill that for purposes of this bill, Lake Champlain will be a Great Lake. And that way, we can get access to the money. So I congratulated her and went to our press guy and said, this is going to be good. We put out a press release and declared that Lake Champlain was a great lake. And it, it made every great lake senator's head explode. It was national news and international news. All the national press came up. And you know, there's parts of Lake Champlain that are only like a mile and a half across. Whereas if you go to Lake Superior or Lake Michigan, they're like oceans. And so we then wrote a letter to Rand McNally and said, you don't actually have to change your atlases. But ultimately, what happened was, I remember Senator Levin called me down to his office, a Michigan Democrat, and said, we're, Lake Champlain is not a great lake. We're going to get rid of it, but we're going to give Pat his money. And that's what we did. And so the performative side was having fun with Lake Champlain. The bottom line was, we ended up getting plenty of, of federal money to combat, um, um, to combat this parasite in Lake Champlain, zebra mussels. So I think what I want to do is stop, because I think we've talked quite a bit. Um, it's, I, I won't speak for Chris in this regard. It's impossible to offend me. I have four children now, their ages from 27 to 33. Every time they're home, I'm canceled before I even get my fork to my mouth. So don't pull your punches when it comes to question time. I think we'll, we'll welcome anything you have. <laughs> So I think that the this goes to a question that we as a nation don't really fully um, have an answer to, or that we may not agree on, as to what is um, what constitutes an effective U.S. senator or a legislator. Um, is it legislating? You know, if you look if you look at the rankings that come out, they will actually on effectiveness of a U.S. senator. They will talk about taking a piece of legislation, introducing it, and getting it through to passage. That's what they determine is effective. Um, or is it constituent service, which is certainly very important? Or is it the soapbox? And uh, Luke knows that when Bernie Sanders first went to Washington as a representative, he was completely ineffective advancing legislation. He didn't care a whit about his constituent service, um, but he... Uh, this is Chris talking. This isn't me, just yeah, FYI. But let's wait and hear you agree with me. Um, but he was great on the soapbox, and everyone thought he was really effective. That's why you sent him to Washington, to shake the bars and shake everything up. Um, I think that when it comes to uh, Patrick Leahy, that the irony is that at times, he has been overshadowed um, by the big news splashes of Senator Jeffords when he declared his independence in 2001, by Bernie Sanders 2016, 2020 uh, presidential bids, and even Howard Dean's run for the presidency in 2004. You know, Leahy's been there, but these guys got the really big splashes, and if you run around the country at those times, Everyone would have known Bernie or Howard 
or Jim Jefferts, and maybe not so uh, Pat Leahy. But I think that um, in the end, his tenure, uh, his long-term impact has been far greater on the nation than any of those three. Would you agree? Um, kinda. Here's, here's one historical point about the Senate, and Chris alluded to it, but he didn't like fill it out. And that is you know, the idea that Leahy was elected when he was 34 years old. He accrued seniority, and at the end, I mean, they used to say about a previous uh, chairman of the Appropriations oh. Committee, a guy named Warren Magnuson from Washington, when Warren Magnuson mumbled in Washington, buildings sprung up in Seattle. You know, and that, at the end of the day, Senator Leahy, because, especially because Vermont was so small, was able to help every corner of this state. But the, the not so dirty little secret about the Senate was it was Southern states that learned the value of electing their senators young. So when Senator Leahy got there, um, and even a little bit before, what you had was all conservative Southern, mostly Republican senators who were chairing committees. And what that meant was they were able to block civil rights legislation for a generation. I got there in the fall of 1982. Were you born then? No. OK. Um, there were still three senators who had signed the Southern Manifesto. Write that down if you don't know what it is. My kids didn't know what it was. In 1956, the Southern Manifesto came out. It was signed by almost every Southern politician with, with a handful of exceptions, including Lyndon Johnson and Al Gore's dad. And basically, and it, was, it was in light of the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education decision, right, which integrated the schools. And it was basically a segregation forever manifesto. And Strom Thurmond was still there. Um, John Stennis from Mississippi was still there. And actually, for my first like three months when I was there, Russell Long, Huey Long's son from Louisiana, was still there. And so that was part, Vermont saw the positive side of what a long tenure, and I would argue that the nation saw the positive side. When it came to this practice, you know, the Senate, for all this gentility and longing for the olden days, they did more to stop the progress of civil rights than anything else. Um, here's what Leahy did incredibly well. It had to do with personal relationships. And the key thing when you think about issues is they're not all partisan. Think about an agriculture bill. Right? It's not Democrats believe one thing and Republicans believe another. It all depends what state you come from. So we came from an agriculture state that relied on small, some would argue, inefficient dairy farms. And we would always be cutting deals with the Mississippi guys on cotton. We were for the cotton program. I mean, with the exception of tobacco, we were open for business. And if, if voting for some wheat subsidy would get us another vote on dairy, we would vote for another wheat subsidy. You know, one, it's not a secret, and since I've, you know, it's, I think it's been written about, but Dick Luger was chairman of the Senate Agriculture Committee. He was a, he was a um, prominent Republican by this standard, so a moderate Republican really hated the dairy program, thought it was subsidizing inefficiency. But he ran for president in 1988. And he was a foreign policy guy. And, and he was known mainly for the nun Luger, how to secure um, fissile nuclear material in Russia after Russia collapsed. Anyway, he had to get 10% of the vote to qualify for federal matching funds. So what we did was we staffed him in Vermont. We literally, he was a Republican, Lay was a Democrat. We tried to help him get to that level and when it came time, we were doing the farm bill, Clark Hinsdale, who's the head of the, um, farm, whatever, bureau. the farm Bureau, came down and, and handed Senator Luger this beautiful photo album of his time in Vermont. And Luger was the guy who saved our dairy compact, even though he hated the dairy program, 
but he actually loved Pat Leahy and he fell in love with Vermont. You know, another example of that are transportation programs. Like, it's if your state, you know, if you're in the Amtrak corridor, you have certain priorities. If you're from Montana or you're from, you know, the Plains, you don't give a shit about Amtrak, right? You don't care about, you know, and, and so, so the reason Senator Leahy thrived was he understood where you crossed the aisle, where you could make deals, and how you could get things done. And, and you know, he also, you know, he did have the ability to see around corners. And I think one of his biggest, you know, talk about legacy. You can have a legacy when nobody even knows what it is, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, everyone at some level has a legacy. But with Senator Leahy, so often the people who benefit from what he did will never know. The kid who doesn't step on a landmine in Cambodia because we, or the fact that we cleaned up Agent Orange in Vietnam, or, but he really was the architect of organic farming, the whole notion of organic farming. And it was in one of our farm bills. And people thought of it as, you know, crunchy granola, Birkenstock. And now it's a multi-billion dollar industry. And value add agriculture in Vermont, as you all know, is what makes Vermont so special. Um, I remember, remember the sheep that were diseased? For some uh, no, it wasn't brucellosis. But yeah, it was yeah. The, some guy, and I hope none of his grandchildren are here tonight. Some guy imported these exotic sheep, and they had some disease that threatened to wipe out the sheep population of Vermont, and you know it threatened the Vermont brand. And we, you know, leapt into action to make sure the sheep were killed. And I remember getting a call it was during Clinton's term, and Clinton always paid attention to everything, and his. Uh, my friend of his who worked with his cabinet secretary called me and said, I just caught a call from Clinton. He's flying back from the Pacific. And he goes, can you just find out from Pat, do we really have to kill those sheep? <laughs> and the answer was yes, we had to kill those sheep, you know, to keep the Vermont brand alive. So related to that, um, our two, two points come to mind when you're talking about legacy in general terms. Um, one is the staff people that Patrick Leahy acquired over, hired and nurtured and kept for um, 48 years. So Luke just mentioned his friend. Well, the, in government, they were all his friends because at one point or another, almost all of the top people in government worked for Patrick Leahy. That's true. And, um, and still do. I, you know, if you look at the Biden administration, a lot of people got their start with Patrick Leahy. Um, and, you know, maybe you, you could even list some of yeah, them. Yeah, no, I, you know, John Podesta, who ended up being Bill Clinton's chief of staff, and actually he's now overseeing all the green energy stuff. You know, when they passed the Inflation Reduction Act, it has $350 billion in green energy stuff. He's there. I mean, Google Beryl Howell, capital B-E-R-Y-L uh, Howell. She is a federal judge, and she has been like the single... Um, obstacle to so many of these Trump maneuvers. Most recently, she was in the news this week because Rudy Giuliani didn't show up for a hearing that he was supposed to be at. But um, Todd Stern, you know, was worked for us on the Judiciary Committee, and and he's the guy that negotiated the Paris Climate Accords. John Finer was an intern of ours, and he's now the Deputy National Security. But I think John Finer was from Bennington. Um, um, I mean, there's a kid named Garrett Graff, who's the <laughs> son of Chris Graff, who was a Senate page for us when he was 16 years old. I remember mm -hmm. he came over to dinner, and I'm like, holy shit, this guy is 16 years old. He's more mature than I am. <laughs> um, um, but yes, I mean, it's... It's, it's pretty it's, remarkable. And, uh, you know, the other thing when you talk about legacy that's really hard to... Um, really hard to define or put a finger on, but I, I think about some of the things like, you know, in the course of the Bush administration, and there were two Bush administrations, but Patrick Leahy provided the most consistent um, and the most long-term counterbalance to the Bush administration overreach. 
Um, and a lot of this after reach after 9-11 after 9-11 and packing the court with federal judges. Yeah. And, you know, that's not probably the stuff that you uh, would would point out as a legacy, but it was critically important to our country. Should we do? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I've been living in Vermont for about 50 years now. And uh, I remember when I came to Bennington, I used to read the Bennington Morning Times. The uh, Times News would come out in the morning and then in the evening as well. So my question to you is, uh, first I'm going to say I'm grateful for Vermont public and getting us connected because we seem here in Bennington not to know what's happening in the rest of Vermont. And it's not just the mountains. It's uh, the uh, ability to know what's happening and the details and sort of things. And I'd love to have you comment on that. Yeah, it's a state of affairs. Uh, our, it's not just Bennington, of course, and it's not just Vermont. It's the entire nation. We're watching the news media just vanish off the face of the earth. Um, and this is a huge loss for Vermont and uh, for the country. And, uh, you know, I think the latest statistics are uh, we're losing a newspaper every two weeks in, 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 in the nation. Um, and we don't have a solution. There's some solution now where people are trying nonprofit news um, and trying to build uh, nonprofit news, and that's actually the model that VT Digger is on. Um, but it's it's a real loss. Um, and you know, Luke talked a little, men made mention at the beginning about Fox News and MSNBC. Um, it's a very serious problem now in the world today that when we were, uh, when I was in the news business, people watched. We all had a common experience, like watching Walter Cronkite at night. We all had a common set of terms because we read the same news stories. Yep. We no longer do that. You know, we, we don't have that anymore. And even the news media that we consider the main street news, the mainstream um, news is failing, uh, failing to cover the politics today. Um, to they're continuing to both sides it, um, say, well, on the one hand, Joe Biden's old, and on the one hand, you know, Donald Trump's old, or on the one hand, this and that, and you can't do that anymore. You know, Jay Rosen, who's a professor at New York University, talks about we need to now be. <clears throat> talking not about the odds, not about the horse race. We need to be talking about the stakes. We need to be talking about what's happening to democracy today. And the news media can't do it. They just aren't equipped to do it. And the people who are um, you know, doing things like uh, supporting President Trump, former President Trump, they're getting their information almost entirely from Fox News. So they are not aware of some of what's just happening in this country today. So, uh, hate to be gloom and doom in answer to your question, but that's all I got, gloom and doom yeah, right now. No, I mean, and Chris kind of sugarcoated it. The Vermont press corps has been completely decimated, completely decimated. I used to walk into the AP office in Montpelier. Chris ran it. There would be seven or eight reporters there. The Rutland Herald would have three in Montpelier. The Free Press would have three or four. Um, and now there's no AP bureau. I guess there's one part-time staffer. And and there's really no Vermont press corps left, and it's a shame. I, I'll tell you one thing that's happening is, you know, you're going to be looking at AI generated stories, um, you know, in your near future. And the other thing that's happening, and and we have a nice control group here. How many of you um, get a lot of news from TikTok? Raise your hand, please. Really? Focus on your feet. <laughs> yeah, no, well, well, look at the Bennington is is Bennington College. I guess is a nice little womb like existence, but the majority well, of this people class, who are least, thirty five and under get their news from TikTok, and and it's just it's a fact, and 
And guess who gets all the TikTok information is the Chinese government. So, so you know, we're in a heap of hurt and it's evolved. My wife ran the Washington desk at NPR for the Trump, you know, campaign in 2016. And the huge debate was, can you use the word lie? And, and it seems so quaint, right? It seems so quaint. You just, I don't know if, if you guys saw three or four days ago, you know, there's a new speaker of the house, a guy who doesn't, has, you know, has never chaired a subcommittee, never chaired a full committee, never managed a bill, but he is God's chosen one. And he announced that he was releasing all, you know, 48,000 hours of tapes from January 6th. And then he said, it's taking a while because we have to black out the faces because of the people who took over the Capitol because we don't want the FBI and the Justice Department going after them. So he's literally, now, the fact is, the Justice Department and the FBI have had all access to these videos for months, but he had to say that and it reverberates around Fox News and OAN and all the other places where these guys hang out. So you have the Speaker of the House who's actually openly saying, I'm obstructing justice. And the repercussions are zero. So I think it begs, I mean, is there a fix if you see some of this stuff? Is there a way for either the government to get involved and break up and say, hey, you know, Fox, That's next semester's lecture series. Yes. Um, and we're going to work on crafting that. How about some more kid questions? Yes. 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 The problem is the people who watch Fox News don't think there are any lying involved no. and they they don't know what they're missing and that's the hard part um, because uh, they're missing a lot. They're missing the truth. So, yes, over there. Uh, I just had a question more about Lincoln's legacy in terms of like foreign policy, humanitarian aid. Obviously, he's done a lot of really great things, like the Lady Law. Um, but I'm curious um, if you have any opinions about, you know, where were circumstances where he could have pushed harder for something, where maybe there were some setbacks. Where did he not succeed in terms of foreign policy in his career? Um, well, <clears throat> I mean, I, 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 here's. Here's an example of a fight we took on, and we actually, you know, don't you like when people say, tell us about your flaws, and they say one of the flaws, and it's actually a strength? You know, it was the end of the first Bush administration where there was a bunch of Soviet Jews who were immigrating to Israel, and Israel said they needed a lot more money to help absorb the Soviet Jews. And at the same time, settlements on the West Bank were ramping up. And Senator Leahy, who's was chairman of the Foreign Ops Subcommittee on Appropriations, you had Tim Reeser up here. Um, he took a very brave stand and said, I want to link any money, any money they're spending on settlements, we're going to take it out of um, money for um, so Soviet refugees. And it was a huge and titanic <clears throat> battle that ultimately he won. But I also think, so that's, that's the weakness that was actually a strength. But I feel like, especially during the Netanyahu government, settlement building has gotten out of control. And they're trying to, and they're succeeding in changing the facts on the ground in the West Bank. And I feel like there used to be 
more of a core of folks, they were always a minority, you'd have to have the administration on your side, who would stand up. And after, that was like his last fight on this, and that was, I lose track of years, but that was probably in 88, 89. Um, and I feel like if we could rewrite the script, if I had, you know, that, that we would have stayed at that longer than we did. Because it really, whenever you, you know, whenever you go at that issue, you just guarantee there's huge blowback on something like that. Um, you, know, you know, it's interesting uh, how Luke at the beginning talked about state, nation, and world. Um, and they would go after, sort of aim towards target each audience. Um, foreign affairs is not something that generally is uh, that people in, in a home state care that much about a lot of those issues. And yet they can be critically important in what a senator does. And I think that there are some times that the senator's staff, the senator, their PR people, they make sure they wouldn't go out of their way to promote what they might be doing on foreign policy. They would focus on what they're doing for farmers and things like that in Vermont. It was only in reading Senator Leahy's memoir that I learned about some of his foreign policy initiatives um, that he did in the 80s. And I go, oh, really? There's a, a Leahy law? There's, oh, let's the, oh, that's interesting. You saved the orangutans in some country. Yes. <laughs> that was a great, it's a great story. Other questions? Um, just uh, following um, the withdrawal of Senator Lady's column and your subsequent termination, oh, wow. have you observed any changes in the journalistic landscape in Vermont, whether in terms of context, approach, or relationships between journalists and politicians? Um, well, it's, it's a really interesting question. I, I think that. Um, the relationship between politicians and the press is one that goes back decades. It's never one that's been solved. Um, you know, President Kennedy was too friendly with the press and the press was too friendly with President Kennedy, um, different with President Nixon. Um, in the Vermont press, we used to actually, uh, governors used to have uh, barbecues every summer with the Vermont press. And Dick Snelling was governor in the 1970s. And some of the press started saying, oh, well, I'm not going to that. I can't eat his hamburger. That, that shows that I'm co-opted by Dick Snelling, the governor. I, I shouldn't see him on a personal basis. Um, and so those governor's lunches, uh, barbecues ended. Um, back before that, when uh, Tom Salmon was governor, there was a place in Montpelier called the Little Valley House. And the governor and legislators and the press would all party together. Um, and there was no wall between the politicians and the press. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's a tough question to know exactly where that wall is on, on relationships. Um, my, my, uh, um, the, the situation that you're talking about actually had nothing to do with my personal relationship with Senator Leahy. It was more about a column that he submitted um, that uh, actually was one he'd submitted year every year. It was just that year. It was tougher on the Bush administration. It was something called Sunshine it's about Week. Boyer, right? Yeah, and uh, um, but it had nothing to do with my relationship with Senator Leahy. And it's interesting. Um, uh, I've always had good relationships with our Vermont politicians because they, one, know the power of the press, and so they want to keep you on their good side, except for Bernie Sanders. We could do a whole seminar on Bernie Sanders uh, and the press. But um, uh, Vermont politicians, they try really hard to be accessible to the press and to their constituents. Every governor that I've ever known, they leave their home phone listed in the phone book. You can call them up. Um, Except that people don't have landlines anymore. Right, that's right. People don't have phone books anymore. But uh, Jim Douglas's home phone is 388-6257 if you want to give him a call. You know, can I, from, 
from inside the senate office you know i learned a super important lesson because i was married to my wife and she was at the time before she was at npr she was just a reporter at a weekly magazine called congressional quarterly and what i saw was she we had four kids under the age of six we both had demanding jobs and what I learned was if you help a reporter do their job, you are more likely to get fair coverage. And so, and, and, and you know, I, our, well, this is being recorded. Some press people are like, screw the press, don't tell them anything, make them go find it out themselves. And it's like, if you have to pick your kid up at daycare, you don't want to have to trek over to the Secretary of State's office and look up an FEC report when you know damn well that the person that you're talking to has the answer. So my approach was always to try to get the press material that they wanted, even if you knew it could bite you in the ass. And, and, and if we had more time, I could tell you some more stories where at the end of the day, I, I found that ended up working out pretty well. well Who's going to ask me about pot, by the way? Well, <laughs> and, and I'll just uh, close that question out by um, saying that Pat Leahy had the best press secretary of any United States senator in the history. His name was David Carl. And David Carl would go out of his way to make sure you had everything. And he would do it 24-7. It, yeah, it, it was just the most amazing press. Also he, very shy. I mean, the way we divided it up in the office was David was just the facts guy, and I was the bullshitter. Um, and it actually worked well. I mean, when I talked to the press, they always had their guard up. When David talked to the press, he was just you know, a total straight shooter. Mm -hmm. And I think that worked out pretty well. I just want to go back to the like, people I can see a bit. And, um, I'm curious what your opinions are on some of the tougher books you made, some of the ones that are um, news and states, like, for example, the Patriot Act, which almost every senator voted for. Mm -hmm. but in retrospect, we view it as incredibly dangerous. Right. Yeah, I think, I, I think that. If, and I don't know if you asked him these questions when he was here. Um, if, if, if I had to guess about, you know, if he had a couple votes, he would pull back. One was the Defense of Marriage Act, which was the compromise, you know, on gay rights during the Clinton administration. Um, one would have been, you know, Anthony Scalia was unanimously confirmed. He might have pulled that back, I'm not sure. On the Patriot Act, and it goes, Philip Baruth wrote a book called Senator Leahy's Scenes from a Life. There's a ton of stuff on the Patriot Act. And we had Julie Katzman and Beryl Howell, now the federal judge who was working on it. And I think what he felt, and Ed Pagano and Bruce may have talked about this when they were here, that he had worked so hard to try to water down as much of the Patriot Act as he could, that at the end of the day, because there were, and, and I, I'm not a lawyer, it, it, it could have been far more draconian than it was. And so, so I don't know that he would say that, that he would have voted a different way especially given the time that we were in. But I can tell you, we were getting death threats. We were getting regularly attacked because we were slowing things down. An ancillary example of that was after 9-11, you know, everyone had a bill to give the Congressional Medal of Honor to every first responder or the blah, blah, special medal. There's like seven different proposals. And Senator Leahy said, what we want to do is quickly, let's have a little commission, give them a six week charge and figure out what the right medal is for these guys. Because the definition of a Congressional Medal of Honor might not fit, whereas a 
Purple Heart might fit. And the New York Daily News, New York Post, Senator denies honors to our fallen heroes. And I remember we got a call in our Burlington office from a, I don't know if he was a retired firefighter, says, I am driving to Vermont right now to kill your boss. And that was the level of vitriol. This was, you know, this was before, uh, well, it was, that, the, that murder charge was before the anthrax guy literally tried to murder him. Um, so anyway, I don't know if that's a response to your, I don't think, I don't think if he were here and you asked him that question, he would have said he would take that vote back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm curious because you talked about the Senate that Senator Lee walked into not existing anymore. Um, and you also both talked about how he was very personable and very work in bipartisan ways and hostile. So if that Senate no longer exists, is that way of working in the Senate also um, a thing of the past? Or is that something that could possibly change the all right, ready to hand me the card. <laughs> um, it's going to be really hard to bring it back. And, and it, it, because right now, everything is a partisan issue. The nation is divided 50-50. The pressure on both sides to stick with your caucus, you know, otherwise, you know, you'd lose a uh, uh, legislative thing is enormous. And especially on the Republican side, if you work with Democrats, you become threatened. You become the, the, the thunder that you feel is on your right. It's not on your left. And we saw that, I mean, Dick Luger, the guy I talked about, you know, who'd be in the Senate Hall of Fame if there was one, was beaten by a right-wing kook in his primary who talked about legitimate rape, like that, that it would be impossible for a woman to be impregnated by a rapist. I mean, these guys were winning, these guys were winning primaries. Mike Castle, who is a very bipartisan Republican from Delaware, um, who is gonna take Joe Biden's seat in 2008, he got beat by a witch in his primary. Literally, a witch, you can look it up. Um, um, so I, you know, there are, Senator Warner's pathologically bipartisan. There are folks who are trying. I think you can look at, you know, this fight over the border security right now. There are some people like Chris Murphy in Connecticut and I think James Langford in Oklahoma who given their druthers would cut a deal. But if you cut a deal, then you lose a big issue. And for the Republicans, the border right now is their best juiciest issue that resonates and now that you know now that the blue cities are being overrun with immigrants you know the pressure not to compromise is enormous yeah and I think too that um, I think this comes out in Senator Leahy's memoir but a lot of the conversations happen at the family level um, with spouses at events cloakroom or whatever, and that no longer happens anymore. People aren't bringing their families down. Um, people are not uh, having those conversations. They're not going out to dinner together. So if you don't have, because a lot of senators never talk to senators. Their staff talks to staff, that talks to staff. Um, and it used to be different, that senators had real relationships. Yes, yeah, so we shared that quite a bit, how you know, when they first arrived, everybody would swap babysitters because that so we go out and that is completely disappeared. Somebody who hasn't asked a question. Yes. Um given Senator Layton's role in judicial confirmations, can you discuss any significant instances of his approach to nominations align or conflict with the department's purposes and priorities? Oh sure. Well it depends it depends what president you're talking about. You know, the Clarence Thomas hearings, you know, he, he, you know, the Bork hearings, the Clarence Thomas hearings, 
he played a decisive role. Um, and, you know, I think the most memorable question he had of Clarence Thomas was, you know, you were in college when Roe versus Wade was decided in 1973. Um, you know, tell us about what it was like being on campus. And Clarence Thomas said, we never had a discussion about this when I was in college. Like, again, in my mind, lying under oath. Um, and that kind of resonated at the time. I think, you know, with Brett Kavanaugh, um, so he was he was going up against the Trump administration. Um, it, there were two things with Brett Kavanaugh. One was, and I don't know if Ed and, and Bruce got into this, but when we were we were in judge wars with the Bush administration, the Republican computer guy in the Judiciary Committee broke into our servers and stole all our stuff. So anytime there was a controversial nominee, they would have our memos, they would have the letters we were gonna write, they would have the questions, and the person in the White House who got all that material was Brett Kavanaugh. And when he was up to be an appeals court judge, he was asked about it, he denied it. Subsequently, you know, I forget, lawsuit, this or that, it came out that he was lying, he was asked about it, he, certainly he asked about it again. Um, and and it it was a big deal, but it didn't matter. At the same time, I think it was his question of Christine Blasey Ford that was not in his prepared staff questions was something like, "What do you remember? What?" The, and she, I don't know if you remember this moment where she said, "It was the laughter, you know, the laughter of these guys, which is seared into." I don't know if it's your hypocompus or thalamus or whatever, but it crystallized, I think, for everyone watching the hearing that she was telling the truth. So, you know, he didn't pull his punches. You, you might pull your punches a little bit if, if the president is of your own party, um, but he would say he took everything, you know, on, on its merits. We've been at it for about an hour and 20 minutes, so. I do want to ask if you both say something about the upcoming 2024 election in terms of predictions, thoughts, uh, concerns. Um, we know that Republicans are trying to sort of right now get to a point of deciding who you know, might be able to make it forward with Joe Biden on the other side. Thoughts and what you're watching and what you're sort of thinking about. You guys are the bellwether. If you guys are active and you guys vote and your friends vote and you, um, um, then we're gonna be okay. If you haven't read Robert Kagan's piece that yeah. was just in the Washington Post, I don't know if you've assigned that, about the coming autocracy. The Atlantic just yeah. published six or seven. Um, you know, we're headed toward, it, it's not too much to say, we're headed toward a dictatorship. And, and the question is, do people who grouse about how old Biden is and he mumbles and he walks like the Tin Man and he should be retired and blah, blah, blah. He's who the Democratic nominee is going to be. He has, uh, he has, you know, done the most major three hundred fifty billion dollars in clean energy, like that for the first time ever gives us a little scintilla of hope that we might possibly get a handle on climate change. He has put the most diverse array of judges, you know, but if young people just sit around and say, oh, you know, I disagree, he's too supportive of Israel, or he's too old, or he's too this, then we're totally screwed. Because guess what? Trump people vote for Trump. I happen to think that these 91 federal indictments, they will help him secure the nomination, but they'll be a hindrance in the general, because he's going to be in court every day. I feel like 
It's like a 10 pound anchor on his ass that's gonna slowly pull him down. But, but that doesn't mean in any way I think this is a slam dunk. I think Luke, Luke mentioned my son. <clears throat> He's a journalist, which is surprising to me that he would become a journalist. Uh, don't know where that came from. But <clears throat> he's a writer um, and a historian, and he actually focuses a lot on, um, on democracy. And he, uh, his last book, he has a new book out now, which, believe it or not, is on UFOs, but his last book was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, is on Watergate. And so he really thinks hard about democracy and the threats to democracy. And I was listening to him on a podcast the other day, and he said that um, 2026 is the 250th anniversary of the United States, July 4th, 2026. And he says, I'm not sure we're going to make it. That's a pretty sobering statement. And I actually know exactly where he's coming from. When Luke talks about um, uh, Robert Kagan's um, piece in the, in the Post, um, you know, he says in there that there's a clear path to dictatorship and the path is getting shorter each day. Um, and I think the press is really at fault with a lot of what's going on here. Um, and some of it is what Luke was talking about, with talking about Biden and mumbling and things like that. But it's also that... Um, the press is allowing everything to become muddy and unclear. So the Republicans are working really hard to saying, yeah, Biden's crooked. Look at that, Hunter Biden, look at that. And they keep yelling about that. And if you get down, and this goes to what we were talking about before, that not many people are reading newspapers, they're not watching the news. Most Americans don't have time for it in their lives. So they're just only vaguely aware of what's going on. And what they're vaguely aware of is there's a mess in Washington. Because golly, I mean, you know, they're all crooked there. Because they can sort of hear, yeah, they know Trump's got all these indictments and things like that. But then they hear, well, Hunter Biden. It's called whataboutism. Yeah. When you see, you know, Trump ended up, well, what about, what about Hunter Biden? What about, yeah. you know, and it makes that's a true. Difference. It makes a difference, and so I think that it, it is scary to see where we are and how much our institutions are failing us right now. And um, we, and it goes back to, I mentioned before, you know, we can't just blame this on it hasn't happened to Trump. The far right's been working at this for 40 years. Okay, you wanna know why I'm against legalizing marijuana? <laughs> okay, who's gonna ask me a question? No, you've already asked two. Okay. Um, I'll put it in the context of Lady. Um, he, in recent years, has come out for the legalization of marijuana, mm -hmm. and like for the federal government not being involved in states legalization uh -huh. of marijuana. I don't know, like, what his private feelings are about it. I do. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to know, like, how you feel about that? How you, feel about that? you know, I think that's. I, I think that's a really pretty sophisticated way of asking the question. And, and I think that you'll see, my own view is if there was a secret ballot on this issue among elected officials, there would be fewer people for the legalization of marijuana than publicly are. Um, I'm not gonna speak for Senator Leahy on that. For me, I got involved with this because someone in my extended family had a very terrible and jarring experience with high potency pot. Um, I know none of the golden agers here ever smoked pot and certainly Chris didn't. When I was at Wills Hall and U at UVM, pot was about 3% THC. Now the stuff, and you guys know, the stuff they are selling is 60, 70, 80% THC, and who's just invested billions of dollars into the marijuana industry? Do we know? Altrio, the tobacco industry, and the liquor industry, 
and the hedge funds. And what's the, what is the addiction model? The addiction model is you make 80% of your profits from 20% of your customers. And the reason there are so many more liquor stores in underserved, under whatever the right word is, um, areas is, is because that's where the money is. And if you Google, Google gummy bears, gummy THC gummies, or Delta-8 gummies, they are targeting our kids. Your brains develop to age 25, at least, maybe a little longer. In Colorado, they are prescribing pot for morning sickness. It's terrible for pregnant women. So do I have a problem with, you know, people smoking joints? I don't have a huge problem with it. But until we get a handle on this addiction industry, and we just, we're not quite out of COVID, apparently three quarters of the people in this room have COVID. But when we were, oh, the mantra for COVID was follow the science. And when I talk to elected officials, I'm like, every study after study is coming out every three weeks, just Google it. Causing psychosis, causing schizophrenia. Not in everybody, but I think 10% of people process marijuana differently than the other 90%. And so, because I had a family experience that woke me up, I just decided to try to do something about it. Chris, you follow this in, in probably written about. I mean, it's been talked about for so long, just about the legalization. Anything in particular that stands out to you? No. What about, well, we have, what about uh, civil unions? Do you mind just saying a word? I thought you covered civil unions. I did. Yeah, civil unions. We, when Howard Dean was here, I remember saying, with the precursor to gay marriage, he said, no, it was gay marriage. Yeah, it um, was. A really interesting, incredibly interesting time. Can you say a little bit about covering that? Yeah, that was, uh, that was a remarkable time in, in Vermont. And actually, you know, when we're talking about the far right movement, you can actually find it alive and well then. There was a whole campaign called Take Back Vermont. Yep. And it actually, those 2000 elections, I think, uh, caused some people here in Benningham yeah. yeah. to lose their seats. Um, they smashed a car, Cheryl Rivers car in the state house lawn. Remember that? I do remember that. I'd forgotten it. They had, somebody remember. had, there's a state senator who's a leader on civil unions. Somebody bought her junky old used car, uh, anti-gay marriage activist, and they drove it up on the state house lawn, had a huge rally, and smashed it with sledgehammers. This I is think today, old Vermont. I think people today don't understand why it could have been so divisive back in 1999 and 2000. Um, because we take gay rights for granted today, even gay marriage. But it was incredibly divisive in 1999 and 2000. It was so divisive. Howard Dean, uh, he may have told you this, um, in the parades after the law was signed, he wore a bulletproof vest. They were so worried about his safety that he would be shot. That's how aggravated Vermont was in the Take Back Vermont um, movement. And you know, in 1999, it, it, this says a lot about our government too. Um, in a lot of really important cases in Vermont, a lot of important issues in Vermont, education assistance, fin school financing, and uh, gay rights, it's the Supreme Court that's actually taken the step. Our legislators were afraid to take the steps or unable to take the steps. The Supreme Court in both of those cases, 1997 and 1999, issued orders that told the legislature, come on guys, you have to do this. And, uh, and I, in 2000, I'll tell you, there were some real heroes in the Vermont legislature. The House Judiciary Committee at the time started out um, dead set against what was at the time called domestic partnerships. But slowly as they listened to the testimony. Thousands of people turned up to testify, even in a snowstorm, about why they were affected. Um, 
they ended up voting, I think unanimously, the House Judiciary for uh, what became civil unions. No one remembers where the name civil unions came up from, but it happened in the House Judiciary Committee. They decided domestic partnership sounded too much like having a custodian working in your house. <laughs> there was a um, great editorial writer for the Rutland Herald named David Motes, and he wrote a book on civil unions that I think won a Pulitzer Prize. His, no, the Rutland Herald won the Pulitzer Prize for his editorial. Okay. And then he wrote the book. Then he wrote the book. Yeah. And one story, one last story about, a personal story about how far we've come on gay rights, although DeSantis and others are obviously trying to turn the clock back. When I was young, maybe a teenager, there was a joke, a riddle, that dad and his son get in a car crash, they rush to the emergency room, the surgeon runs in and says, I can't operate on this boy, um, he's my son. And what's the answer? And everyone was puzzled and puzzled and puzzled. And finally I said, oh, the woman, the doctor's a woman. And I was like, oh, that's the answer. So five years ago, we're sitting at our kitchen table and my very, very activist daughter and her best friend, who's a doctor, or she was in medical school, um, I said, "There's this joke is coming back around, so I'll give it to you. Do you know." dad and his son um, get in a car crash, they go into the hospital, I can't operate, um, he's my son. And both of them at the same time blurt out, two dads. <laughs> and I looked at my daughter's friend, we were just at her wedding, I said, Lily, you're a fucking doctor. <laughs> like, and, and what came to their mind, I. Can we bleep the F-bomb out of that? OK. Um, anyway, so women in the audience, you got some work to do. Um, I hope you'll stick around and have some coffee and cookies with us. Sure. And please, please, please let this be uh, just your first stop at the MC College in Clark, New York. And guys, I'm Luke Albee, A-L-B-E-E -E at Gmail. If you're, you know, in Washington and are looking for an internship or have a question or going to push back on me on pot, feel free to send me an email. Or if you want him to write your papers at the end. Of the <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both. Anybody want this? <laughs>